Uh, good morning, everybody. Well, the joint meeting between the House Education Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, this what we could call a member listening tour where we don't have to go anywhere, but they everybody comes to us. And it's really an opportunity for us to hear from our colleagues uh, who have also been doing a lot of deep thinking on the issue of education finance, education in general. And we wanted to offer all of them an opportunity to come and speak to our two committees. We have a good long list that will take us uh, well past 11. Uh, we do not have a built-in break in our schedule. So members, uh, as you may need to leave, go ahead, just do it quietly and as, as, uh, as quietly as possible. Um, everybody has a, a six minute time. Um, we will uh, sort of offer gentle reminders as you get close. Uh, but I think with that, we'll just get rolling. Everybody feeling ready here around the table? Is, yes. is someone taking like notes or minutes about what <clears throat> people are saying? Uh, there's no official note taker, but there's lots of pads of paper here if anybody needs them. Okay. And if you want to be the official note taker, please feel free. <laughs> I can do that. I can look for trends. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right, uh, let's let's get rolling so we don't already get behind schedule. Uh, Representative Laura Sibelia, you're first, right up there. Thank you. Good morning, and I did submit my testimony. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Start right up. Thank you all for pulling back on the tax cap earlier this year. Uh, before most bud budgets were voted, um, that was extremely difficult. And uh, I appreciate the communication and the time uh, that local officials, voters had to adjust, you know, it was really short. Uh, I do not believe we have time or political cover to change the education fund mechanism again this year. Changing the rules on funding after most districts have voted on their budgets some have also already re-voted, will add more fuel to the fire that the governor and the legislature have created over many years. I am preparing my testimony. I have reflected on my own family's experiences. Uh, we encountered significant challenges, including poverty and abandonment. The small public of my isolated Southern Vermont town played a pivotal role in where I and my 11 siblings find ourselves today. Accessible, quality, public education is one of the most important publicly obligated opportunities rural and poor kids will have to change their destiny. I am committed to advocating for these kids every day. 27 years ago, Act 60 was introduced to reform Vermont's education finance system, aiming to equalize funding among school districts, reduce property tax rate disparities, and ensure equitable access to education resources. <clears throat> it also was intended to preserve local control. It fell short in addressing differences in educating various student demographics, resulting in funding disparities that adversely affected rural and poor students and taxpayers for two decades. That was the people waiting issue. While Act 27 eventually rectified that injustice after more than a decade of effort, the correction is one of the things causing a shock to the financing of our state. Another is our repeated failure to provide proper state level technical support and guidance to a distributed system undergoing massive demographic change. And the governor and the legislature own that. Another is opting to buy down the rates rather than provide long-term sustained help for our local districts to adjust. And the governor and the legislature own that. Another is the governor and the legislature continually trying to buy more things out of the education. <laughs> I thank you for inviting this testimony. 
I have some suggestions. First, I think we need to acknowledge that one of the main drivers of these difficulties facing students and our taxpayers are our actions and the actions of the administration, multiple administrations, multiple legislatures. We need to acknowledge that there are deserved trust issues in this system. We need to avoid deceptive practices or attempts to conceal information from the stakeholders, taxpayers. We need to be really deliberate about clarity. Building consensus on the problem to be solved and the goals to be achieved. Uh, my goal, my vote would be to ensure a more sustainable and stable governance and funding system capable of delivering high quality education throughout the state. But let's do the work to find consensus on what the problem is we all want to solve in Vermont. Um, I would really encourage us to recognize our limitations. So please seek appropriate help designing public processes to re-engage our communities in goal setting and problem solving, and then public, publicly implement, implementing modernization of this. We cannot act hastily um, in this moment. I, again, be intentional about providing clear and accessible information to stakeholders. I would encourage us to get qualified public education leaders in the administrative uh, seats as soon as possible. Uh, I've sponsored a proposal uh, for this. Uh, I've sponsored several proposals which are in your various committees. This one is H851. Uh, this is an act relating to creating a dep uh, department and commissioner of education and uh, amending the duties and composition of the state board of education. I think that's imperative. We need to depoliticize this system, do whatever we can to depoliticize this system. We need to draw bright lines around the education fund and differentiate between local decision making and state directed spending. This will help us to be more accountable. Uh, let's do our job of providing oversight. Same rules for the same dollars. Uh, I, provo I propose multiple examples to your committees, H113 in Ways and Means, H258 in House Education. Let's stop making the problem worse in the interim. Uh, we are really fragile right now. Uh, I propose a suggestion on this to House Education this year, um, age 634, related to school closures. It's going to take us time to right the ship. And uh, we are really vulnerable in uh, rural and, uh, parts of the state, our education uh, systems. And finally, we need to stop buying down the tickets. I think we hopefully all know this. This is exacerbating the problem and also delaying really needed conversations. Um, I think there are no easy answers, um, and I encourage you not to seek easy answers, and I thank you for having us here. Thank you, and thank you for being very well-timed. Like to the second. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Dickinson. Boy, what a group. <laughs> Uh, for the record, I am Representative Lynn Dickinson. I represent St. Albans Town, and thank you for letting me speak at this meeting. I served for eight years. <clears throat> I served for eight years on the board of trustees of DFA St. Albans, which was an independent school that served as the public high school for St. Albans students in the city and town, among other communities. <laughs> there wasn't anything independent about it. All of its revenue was from local, state, and federal money. The trustees were appointed by the city council and the town select board. The residents of the city and town had no voice on who represented them, nor could they vote for the BFA budget. I worked over many years with others to make BFA a public union high school. We succeeded in 2004 when I was elected to be a board member of the new union high school. I learned two lessons from this experience. Number one, schools work better for students in the schools if K-12 is integrated within the administration and the school board. And two, we need accountability financially and academically for our students, administration, staff, faculty, and especially for our taxpayers and community. Financial accountability, if there, there is a lack of accountability that results in unfocused administration and program curriculum development. I saw that especially at BFA. Nothing focuses the board or administration more on priorities than a budget to feed. As a school board member, I observed over many years that money is often not the only and sometimes not the most important reason for a budget to feed. 
It often is about other reasons, like a difficult and hard to resolve issue for a student or teacher. Parents may feel the school is unresponsive or not listening to their concerns. In academic accountability, what I observe is what appears to be a pattern of moving students along despite little or no evidence of academic mastery, leaving many students behind, unprepared, and adrift. Here in Vermont, we take pride because we have a very high graduation rate from high school. But 45% of our graduating seniors do not pursue any post-secondary program after high school. The superintendent in my area pointed out recently that we have few graduation requirements and we need to fix this. My experience as a high school student in New York State was having to take a subject matter exam as a final exam. Regents exams created accountability for students and for the school as well. <clears throat> I have two suggestions. One, we need to adjust our tax discounting to return more accountability to taxpayers, school boards, and administrators. This change could be phased in over several years, such as five years. Taxpayers and others need to be reconnected to the actual cost <clears throat> So they have to have financial consequences for their votes. And number two, Vermont is the size of Rochester, New York. And I feel we can develop a regents type exam statewide for a regents type diploma, maybe a green and gold diploma. That establishes graduation requirements and more accountability. Exams could also be developed for non-traditional courses such as CTE students and others. And if you'd like any more uh, information or clarification on my uh, statement. I'd be happy to talk to you privately, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a overall very impressive turnout so far for the crazy roads we've had. Uh, Representative Holcomb, you are next. I just suggest notes be posted on your website testimony be posted. Yeah, if you have written tests, I think a lot of people have submitted their written okay. testimony that's already posted, but if great. Um, have it and have not sent it in, that would be great. Okay, thank you. That's rewrote this morning, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Representative Anthony, there is space at the table if you would like to pull your Good morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the hard work you're doing. My name is Rebecca Holcomb. I'm from Norwich. Um, I became a principal in a small Vermont rural school years ago where I was surrounded by three small schools with even greater issues. We were at a crossroads. People sound familiar, failing infrastructure, persistent high turnover of teachers, high poverty in some of our towns, uneven results, inequity across the districts, unsafe and inaccessible buildings, neighboring high schools that were saying they might not be able to accept or enroll our tuition students. We turned education around. Um, we brought our communities together. And we started by talking about what we wanted all our students to know and be able to do and how we would know that they were able to do those things. This will sound familiar. We had shared goals. The goals are what drove the process and the reform. We measured the process and we used to it to identify whether we were on track. We had to float a bond to put our children into fewer buildings and putting our, our children into fewer buildings saved us the money we needed to do to make the educational improvements. What was different then? We had strong state leadership for education and for schools. We had coherent policy, not policy that worked at cross purposes. We had higher expectations and high trust. We had construction aid. And we didn't think parents, especially of vulnerable children, should have to fight to get access to a good school for their child. We didn't just see the education fund as the go-to purse to fund anyone and everyone's bright new idea. This was also in the wake of Act 60 and some of our districts had new tax capacity to support those changes. But it is not about money. You've heard that. It is about how you choose to spend your money. And what the state did at that time is supported us with the Vermont Institute of Math and Science. And on site, we had state supported graduate level courses at our school sites to support payments and literacy instruction. We also, I tell this because right now our school personnel are working so hard under deteriorating conditions to be the change that our kids need. But this sense of that we are gonna do this together for all of our children, this is what we're losing right now. We've lost the focus on making our schools better and instead we're focused on just how adding new but usually poorly supported programs and choices at every turn will make the difference. But this deterioration is starting to really show. Every system, including our own education system, is designed to get the results it delivers, and that is true of education in Vermont. If we don't like the rising and unaffordable property taxes and diminished performance, we have to change our strategy, not just pour more money in. I, um, 
I did write three pages of suggestions. I threw them out because I am here today to implore you to start with the education system. Focus on figuring out what the purpose of strong and and fair public education is in the 21st century. Until we figure out that purpose, we can't tackle the incoherence and the fragmentation that is currently undermining our educators and eroding opportunity for our kids. And they have one chance. Before we talk about funding, we have to talk about vision and structure. A journalist I know told me that he knows he's hit it right when everyone's mad at him. Our policy decisions this year are probably gonna be the same. Everyone's gonna have to give a little to get us to a place that's better. Um, one of my districts, two of my districts are actually gonna have to pay more. That's okay, I can push them on that. One of them is gonna have to accept some limits on tuition because people in those other districts, they're not gonna pay to send other people's kids to prep schools in other countries where they don't serve kids with disabilities and they are not gonna pay to fund religious education in violation of their own Vermont constitutional rights. You know what the others are, but here are some of my high level suggestions. We have to start with sustainable scale, particularly at the middle and high school level. Some of our schools cannot provide students the support and the breadth of opportunity they deserve. They have one chance no matter where they live. For towns that operate, this is going to mean targeted consolidation. That is a hard, hard conversation and we have to support them through it. But this effort is futile. It is a waste of time and it could make efforts worse if it doesn't involve limits on tuition. If you, you need to go no farther than the Black River High School, which the district closed because it was too small to offer opportunities to kids, but which is now home to an even smaller private school that is taxpayer funded and that um, actually doesn't even have a teacher on staff, right? So think about that. When we're talking about quality, do we even know what we're getting? And we're certainly paying more to get it. Um, we also need to depoliticize education policy and the state board. I was secretary under two administrations, a Democratic administration and a Republican administration. I will tell you that this body lost access to nonpartisan, clear, consistent, high quality data that you actually need to make good decisions. You need to pull the AOE back under an independent and representative state board, representative meaning the representing the diversity of the state, instead of tying it to an unstable two-year political process. This would also enhance your access to data and ensure greater nonpartisan transparency that you need to make decisions that are hugely consequential for our children and our communities. We also need to address cost shifts from state to local budget. There is no fire hose big enough to fill the leaky bucket our public education fund has become. I'm just going to say that again. Unless you get control of the cost shift, you will not be able to raise enough revenue at a, at a rate that taxpayers can afford and sustain um, moving forward. In appropriations, and you're going to hear from someone else in appropriations, he may say that as well, but we get to see how state underfunding of state initiatives dries up local costs in local school budgets and also undermines the actual kinds of two-generational solutions that we need. That is hard work. That is our job. So we need to get on that. Um, just to close, years ago, I used to travel all over the state to speak with school districts, legislators, communities about education. I had a slide I often used to close that had a picture of a goose and a golden egg. The goose was the education fund. The goose the, and the egg were our shared commitment to the shared well-being of our children. We are losing that. We are moving from a system of public education as a public good to public education as a public benefit. My fear at the time was that we would kill the golden goose by asking it to lay too many eggs that were not part of our shared vision for our children. In the past several years, we drove a knife into that goose. From our failure to respond to the Carson decision to the predictable and unaffordable property taxes that we're all coping with this year, we drove a knife into our shared responsibility for the well being of our children, as well as our ability to do it in a way that people can afford. I am so grateful to you. I am so grateful to you for the hearings you have to develop a nuanced understanding of both the opportunities and the risks. That is the right kind of leadership. I implore you not to move too fast because we have to get this right. We need your leadership to help us build back our shared sense of purpose and to make the high level strategic changes that have to happen so that our schools across the state can deliver on our vision and our promise to future generations. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you very much. Representative Harrison. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Appropriations is really turning out. We see a lot of money. You see. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
little intimidating. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, for the record, my name is uh, Representative Jim Harrison from the community of Chittenden. Um, I have some rambling thoughts, so please bear with me. I don't have the answers. If there were easy answers, I'm sure we would have found them and implemented them. I don't have them. I can't even make my picks in March Madness correctly. But like many of you, I have heard plenty about the projection for hikes in this year's property taxes. I recognize we need to balance any solutions with court decisions on equal opportunity as directed at past court cases. CLA changes can greatly outpace a person's ability to pay even when the budget doesn't increase much. Last year, I heard from a number of Killington residents because their taxes went up 18%, some of it due to an increase in their budget, but much of it due to the changes in their CLA. And just because their home value went up doesn't mean they have an ability to pay higher taxes. Rises in CLA likely mean they will also be less help if they qualify for a property tax credit. This year, CLA went down another 10 points in my town of Chittenden, as well as others in our district, and they will automatically mean higher taxes. Killington will be looking at an effective tax rate, $3.19 for education this year. That is 29% increase on top of last year's 18%. When we vote on school budgets, it needs to be clear on what the proposed budget does to our tax rate. It has to be more transparent. It can't be vote to approve 6 million, 10 million, whatever the number is. We don't even have a comparison with last year. We need to know the effect on taxes when we vote. Our school budget in Chittenden and Menden for Barstow was voted down on town meeting. It's gonna be re-voted later this month. It was reduced by a whole $29,000. Perhaps we should vote on school budgets in November for better participation. In a normal year, having 25, 28% to vote on them in March is not helping us with buy-in on the result. We need to incent or mandate more consolidation. One of our local papers published the salaries of various administrators in one Rutland County school district, 163,000 for the superintendent, 138,000 for a special services director, 123,000 for the finance director, and much more. If this is what the market is for these positions, we need to do what we can to spread out that overhead with more students, which can be done through consolidation. Have the state take over school budgets. As long as the legislature is gonna be charged with setting statewide tax rates without any control on the budgets approved, is not helpful and does not lead to good results. With 640,000 residents, we are just a medium-sized city. How many school districts would you expect to have in Boston? Probably one. Give each district the same amount per student as a base, and everything above them is on them, is on them, everything above that. You want to operate schools with small enrollments in your area, you pay for the extra if it's inefficient and above. Um, no one wants to lose their small school. I get it, but we all pay for that. We need to change that. You have a difficult job ahead of you in the coming time. I encourage you to think about different solutions, not just resort to raising new taxes which just throws more money at spending increases. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Carpenter. Thank you for making this opportunity for all of us um, to testify today, to share our ideas, and to continue this important conversation 
concerning the current state of uh, public education. I am not an expert in school policy or educational finance. I come to you today as a representative of my community, as a mother of a student with special needs, and as a former middle school teacher and principal. You asked for specific and actionable, and I'm gonna do my best to be brief. I have five key points. My first recommendation is that policy leads and funding follows. Public education in Vermont needs to serve all children, affording our students educational opportunities that are equal in quality, that are equitable, inclusive, and affordable. This is a big ask, and because it is, this redesign needs to be led by the experts in education policy, whether it be by our education committees, a task force, informed local and national experts, or some combination of this. Really creating a unified mission and vision for our public school in our state is the first step. Then our funding formula should be developed to rework, operationalize this vision. My second ask is for a re-examining of our education programs and priorities. As any teacher or school leader, and they will tell you there are so many needs, mandates, and competing priorities. The strain this puts on our people and our pocketbooks is tremendous. And I would ask our task force to re-examine what programs comprise our current system with an eye for prioritizing and consider what can be removed from the public education domain. I'm not asking to shift things out of education funds simply to be funded by general fund. I'm asking to look for efficiencies and ways that we can better use our human and fiscal resources. So one example um, to point how this might be addressed is how we address mental health care system um, and care in our student, for our students in public school. If we prioritize and strengthen mental health care services through partnership with our designated agencies, designated agencies can provide services to students, wrap supports around families in flexible ways, and draw down federal money through Medicaid. This could decrease the burden on schools and eliminate redundant service models that often compete for the same work pool. We, could not, we would also not leave federal money on the table. OCs is another example of possible ways to build efficiencies, and I hope that we will continue to look for others like these. Third, I would ask that we, as we look towards consolidation, we adopt a policy of school designation. If a school district closes an existing school, it should provide education for its residency by de designating other public schools to serve in this capacity. This keeps our precious state dollars in public school system. It also provides receiving and designated schools the opportunity <clears throat> to plan for incoming students. This type of stability and predictability is essential for educators to meet the needs of children they serve, strengthening our system rather than draining it. Fourth, if we are going to have a strong statewide system, we need to rearticulate what every student deserves, define our measurable outcomes and collect data from every school that receives public money. How else will we know if we are making progress and where we need to change? There is so much good work being done in our schools and I just wanna pause and say that for our educators out there, thank you. We should highlight and build upon existing models of success and data will inform our process. And finally, we need to listen to our communities and find short-term fiscal help for them. They're asking for this help, and I feel it is imperative that we provide some aid now in this legislative cycle. Some of the things we should not do, I feel, is race to fix the formula ahead of policy work, or buy down the tax rate and dig the hole deeper. Things we could explore, using revenue like the cloud tax or streaming tax, or perhaps something else, to pay for some of the initiatives that we have already instituted, like universal meals. A robust and high quality public education is the backbone of democracy. It touches every child and family in Vermont and must be the top priority of this body, just like housing, just like climate resiliency. I look forward to working together to bring the best that we have to the children of Vermont. And thank you for this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we are actually a couple of minutes ahead of schedule here. Representative Murphy, thank you. All right, Representative Murwicki. We're up. Don't jinx it. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Mike Murwicki, State Representative from the Wyndham Ford District. <coughs> 
Putney and Gunderston. Uh, I want to thank you all for doing this. I think it's indicative of how, how deep you're, you're willing to dig uh, to get input and help us move forward on this. So thank you so much. Uh, I am sharing some notes from constituents that I reached out to who are active in educating our children and, and on school boards, uh, along with some of my own thoughts. So uh, first I wanna state that I support the priority of educating our kids to the best of our ability. Uh, I recognize that the children of today will be taking our blood pressure tomorrow, and we certainly want them to be able to do it best of their ability, and we wanna expand even what they do beyond that. Um, the first suggestion I've gotten from a constituent was about non-homestead tax rates. Their property types lumped into this, but second homeowners and short-term rental properties are contributing to a crisis that we're now spending tax dollars to fix. These types, are, these types of properties are responsible for the challenges and they should bear more of the burden. Uh, another um, suggestion is a longer CLA look back. The current real estate market swings might be a bit improved by a longer look back on the CLAs, especially in small towns where a handful of properties <laughs> yes. can really skew the numbers. The tax rate increase is due to statewide spending increases, not market changes, but is a thought to make rates a bit more predictable. Um, it might be helpful to identify new channels to subsidize the social service components of our current educational system. Schools are acting as social service agencies, which I think they should, and I'll say a little bit more about that. However, the Ed Fund is covering this as it never was before, and we are diverting funds to handle this. Um, this is a consensus from our district, including myself, that it would be helpful <coughs> for a look back to whether we're getting what we thought we would from Act 46. Is there research that provides outcome and indicators saying we delivered what was promised. I will. Share that I want to suggest, lastly, my support for community school. Uh, 20 years ago, I worked for a small private social service agency, which was originated by the principal and school counselor of our school. Our idea was to, based on Maslow's theory of the hierarchy of needs, um, address the concerns which weren't necessarily directly educational, but were affecting the education of our children, whether it was the food shelf, child care, aftercare, um, we provided these services, and I think as we move along, expanding that to some other schools where it's schools for point of service, for medical services, for counseling services, I think this is the direction to go, and I'm wholeheartedly suggesting that we move forward with community school. Um, those are my remarks for today, and I, I again want to close with thank you all for making this, this taking this opportunity to, to, to give us time to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Representative Quimby is on Zoom. Representative Quimby, welcome to our meeting room. Morning. <laughs> um, so I don't have uh, things as prepared. I wasn't uh, even sure I was gonna join, but uh, my history, I, I taught middle school mathematics for over about 33 years in Orleans Central, Barton Graded School. And I was very fortunate that the community was very supportive of our budgets and our needs. Um, consolidation is always a tricky issue. I went to a small school, high school that ended up closing a few years ago. But uh, when we combined from several districts into one, it didn't end up being a cost saving. And when we had serious discussions last year about consolidating, because we cannot staff the buildings, we just can't get the staff to cover our six elementary schools. Um, I thought, well, there's three principals that we will eliminate, so we'll save some money. But we were told they would actually have to hire additional administration if we close schools. Um, so, but I think, you know, it's a hard conversation. 
Um, it, they're having very serious conversations again this year because of staffing shortages. Um, and I've seen over the years that education tends to be very reactive, as some other people talked about today. It is a shiny new penny. Let's jump on it. So the math program or the reading program or whatever that we spent thousands of dollars on a couple of years ago is going in the dumpster and we're getting a new one. Um, we're not going to sit at individual desks. We're going to get tables. So we get all new furniture. Well, then COVID, so we need to go back to desks. Put up a wall, take down a wall. Um, small things, but it becomes cumulative. Um, so I didn't have a lot of other thoughts to share on short notice, but certainly willing to talk with the education committee anytime you have questions that maybe I can give some input on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Frumstead, we are ahead of schedule, but uh, the folks who are on deck are going to maybe fill in some time for a break. Between you and a break. Uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> a few time. people after you. <laughs> okay. All no right. Um, for the record, I'm Jessica Bremstead, representative in the Champlain Valley School District. So, first, I appreciate your holding this important hearing, giving us an opportunity to, to talk with you about what we're hearing. Um, I've received emails, phone calls, you name it, from Shelburne and St. George residents. And we're really one of the more urban districts, I think, since um, that we've heard from this morning. Um, and so it also gave me an opportunity to, to put together my own thoughts and recommendations for change. I am one of the, I already said this, but I'm one of the representatives from the Champlain Valley School District. We just cut 5 million from our budget a couple of weeks ago. Most everyone feels and seems worried and confused. We care deeply about educating our children and supporting our incredible teachers, paraeducators, and staff. So many wonderful people who have helped many of our children. Very hard work every day. <laughs> I cut some out, so <laughs> you can stick with the time. Um, so a few thoughts and even a few recommendations. Um, Vermont, here it goes. Vermont has too many small schools and small school districts. Why not one school district? The state could even take over. This drives a lot of direct education delivery and administrative spending that we just can't afford. This structural issue also impacts spending on salaries and health benefits as the effort to manage these costs are fragmented across the large number of school boards we have. So much so that our education system in Vermont is dominated by small schools. History shows scale saves money, autonomy costs money. The structure of our education system in Vermont seems somewhat inefficient and expensive, and we need to figure out how to address this first before we spend more state dollars. We are burdening our, ed two, so second, we are burdening our education budget with a myriad of social services that should be funded out of the Agency of Human Services, not out of our education spending. While these services may be needed, definitely needed, in my committee I can assure you of that, and the schools might be the most efficient and effective delivery mechanism, the costs should be removed from education spending and funded out of AHS. Universal Meals is another example of a state mandate that should not be funded out of education spending. How about a sugar tax to fund healthy meals in our schools? This doesn't solve the overall state budget problem, but brings better clarity to what we are spending on education versus social services. If we do this right, there's a good chance we could match some of those funds with federal funds. The com three. The combination of the income sensitivity provisions of our property tax system and the subsidies for small schools is distorting decision making around school funding. Too many taxpayers and too many small towns are insulated from the costs of paying for the current system, and these distortions need to be addressed. Beyond the small town local control ethos in Vermont, these policies are seriously hindering further consolidation and optimization of our schools and school administration. Fourth, 
We need to create a panel of smart, experienced individuals from a variety of different sectors in our economy, plus look to academic folks who are tax experts and education experts to help guide and recommend possible changes to our current education system. System. I would add that um, the work that I did this summer on government accountability, we used NCSL to help us look broadly at what other states are doing that have um, similar demographics as ours that are rural. Places, places can really show, show us some incredible um, positives and negatives. We need to reevaluate what we are trying to achieve have a vision for what success looks like and put in place accountability metrics that can help us measure success uniformly across all Vermont schools. It's shocking to me as I've looked closer that we don't have that. We, we can't equally judge how our schools are doing. We all know this isn't easy work or it would already be fixed. I know that as a legislator that's been here for four terms, we have amazing legislators and we would be fixing this if it was easy. So I, I can't say that enough. Um, I think this commission or committee can take a look around our country of what is working, the opportunities that other states are taking advantage of, and the challenges they are overcoming. We need recommendations from the experts in education and tax policy. We need to look at our education system holistically, including how we raise tax revenue to fund our schools. How this funding is allocated, the structure, management, and cost of our statewide education system, and the results we are getting that are comparable, comparably measured so the data can help us make better informed decisions both now and tomorrow. Transparency is necessary so that every Vermonter, this would be my fifth, transparency is necessary so that every Vermonter can know and understand how we are funding our schools and why it is important to do so. This would create buy-in from everyone wherever they live. I recognize this is going to be a very difficult political challenge, say political challenge, particularly as it relates to the pressure that will result from further effort to consolidate any aspect of our system. However, the status quo is clearly not sustainable or we all wouldn't be here and change, perhaps fairly radical change, is called for. We need to have a sense of urgency on this issue. And I know today, as I was listening, I'm writing down, oh, I like the way that sounds better, or I think this, or should I say that? But I, I really believe that um, this is urgent. So let's bring everybody in on, that can help us and get it done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Representative Lipsky. Morning. Morning. For the record, I'm Representative Jed Lipsky. I represent Lamoille One District Stowe. I'd like to uh, first of all thank uh, Chair, the chairs uh, Conlin and Kornheiser for and their committees for uh, inviting us and me as well to this uh, joint committee meeting to share at, the, at your hearing some ideas for tackling some of the complex issues that we face. It's been a privilege to serve in my second year in the House, bringing my experience and expertise as a small business owner, former school board member, logger, and longtime Vermonter to these conversations. Vermont's an incredible place to raise children, and our schools are filled with amazing educators and students. I'm here today, as I worry, we are losing the trust of our communities and taxpayers. On town meeting day, over a third of the school bu budgets were defeated. This represents the largest number in recent history and demands our urgent attention. Vermonters have sig signaled loudly they cannot afford the significant property tax increases that have resulted from an unprecedented level of education spending across the state. With the declining population, aging infrastructure, and shifting demographics, this is a crossroads moment for public education in Vermont. In the current model, school boards determine their spending, voters approve, and then legislature is responsible for funding these decisions. 
Due to our incentive structures and the political dynamics that lay out in each town, spending does not always result in improved student outcomes. Quite often, districts that should be investing more decide to use taxing capacity to reduce tax rates. Districts that should be spending less decide to use taxing capacity to increase spending even more. <clears throat> Until this year, many voters have not truly understood how closely we're tied together with our local spending decisions. For the Brigham decision, we have a constitutional requirement to provide equitable education to every Vermont student. The current funding formula is not meeting that requirement and until we have a new formula in place, a quality education for all Vermont students will not be possible. This will take time and should be a top priority for our next legislative session. In the meantime, we must contain costs and prevent this situation from occurring again next year. In conversations with school leaders, community members, and other legislators, I asked the committee to consider two uh, of the following thoughts. First, please reinstate the excess spending threshold. This was a tool that has been used successfully in the past to hold districts to reasonable increases in spending. In, in a shared system, we must ensure there's enough for everyone without overtaxing our residents. Secondly, please reinstate ballot language that is transparent to voters. We must rebuild trust by providing voters with the actual spending increases per pupil. With new terminology such as long-term weighted average daily membership, voters believe the system is designed to intentionally confuse or make it appear that spending is less than it is. Our communities will make responsible decisions if they have the right information. Voters need to understand what the increase is year over year spending. As mentioned, these are only short term steps until a more thorough, comprehensive plan can be put in place to redesign the funding form. You'll, again, appreciate all of your uh, commitment and time. I did send some of this testimony to Sorsha, who is uh, one of your committee assistants and Maybe it'd be possible that could be shared with the education committee as well. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Do a, a quick uh, jump around here for those of you who are following the list, just because we're ahead of schedule. So now we've got folks who are ready and others who are on their way. Uh, so we're going to go to Representative Dolan, who is joining us on Zoom. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you for this opportunity to present to you today. I am Representative Carrie Dolan from Washington 2 District, and these comments are from me and my district mate, Representative Dara Torrey. I first want to preface my remarks by acknowledging the important work of our schools. School staff show up every day to get our kids to school and to teach, mentor, support, and inspire them. As you are fully aware, the historic number of failed school budgets following town meeting day is an indicator of affordability, marking how Vermont has perhaps reached a tipping point regarding the lack of affordability of our education funding system in its current state. One of our concerns with the local control component of our funding system is that it is a system of high stakes. Having the school budget vote as the only cost management strategy is fundamentally unfair to our school boards and superintendents. Additionally, failed budgets affect staff morale and our ability to attract teachers to the profession and the cohesiveness of our communities. I thank you for the committing to uh, get in all interested parties to the table in the uh, perhaps with respect to the coming legislative session, I do ask that you consider the following seven points. First, one more injection of state funding to address this year's shortfall, accompanied by timely information to school districts, in fairness to school districts and taxpayers. Districts faced un, uh, substantial increases in costs beyond their control, but received little in guidance from the Agency of Education and from the legislature in managing those costs. Two, a simpler system 
that has more that more closely ties local voting on school budgets to the property tax rates. Taxpayers and school districts need more predictability and transparency. Three, a commitment to address the statewide drivers that have shifted funding from the general fund via state agency budgets and special funds to the education fund, such as in the delivery of mental health and counseling services or in the remediation of PCB contamination. Addressing this concern pertaining to the delivery of mental health and counseling services will have an equally important benefit of restoring the strength of our mental health delivery system for families and students statewide. Four, a system designed to improve both the delivery of quality education program and greater economies of scale. Five, partnerships with communities and public school districts, using school infrastructure funds as an incentive to help schools conduct maintenance and capital improvements. Such incentives must cover any fit up costs necessary to achieve economies of scale targets, such as in class size or in staff to student ratio targets. Six, guarantees of non-discrimination in the use of public education funds. And finally, my seventh consideration, a formal replacement of a portion of the property tax with other state revenues, such as the income tax revenues. This action will, prov will provide greater clarity in how the system considers income sensitivity, eases up on property taxes, and restores more of the property tax for municipal use. Thank you for your time and opportunity here. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now go to uh, Representative Graining. Good morning, Representative Spring, Jericho. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I have my notes in lots of different places and I'll do my best to be concise. And also, um, I apologize that I'm going to probably repeat. I have been in committee focused on that and really not paying attention to what's going on in here. I plan to listen later. So thank you for doing this. Um, so I realize that you're expecting testimony to be focused on what we can and should do this year. Um, I don't know that I'm gonna accomplish that homework assignment, but just looking at this year, I do appreciate the possibility to use the cloud tax to cover the cost of um, universal school meals. And I think it's really important that we think about that. We think about when we're adding um, co costs to the Ed Fund that we figure out how we're gonna pay for those. And I think that's, um, I appreciate that tremendously. We also need to make sure that every Vermonter um, knows that we heard their pain, um, the pain they're feeling from the tax increases. And a lot of that is, you know, because we bought down the rate for the past couple of years, but it means still that people are paying more taxes. So both and, and we just, we need to be responsive. Um, Okay, so I want to look to the future, and I plan to stay really big picture here. Um, we can and do use tax policy to influence behavior. We know that. We do that. And I want to acknowledge that um, and set it aside, and I'll come back to it. But I think that it's important that we have that as part of this picture. Um, and then look at what we're listening to. So when we hear from public school leaders, they're asking us for a clear statewide vision. What do we want our schools to do? What do we want those outcomes to be? How do we want that to, how do we want that to look? Should they just keep filling the gaps as they're required to, right? Every student that comes in, they have to take care of them to the best of their abilities or better. Um, are we all moving in the same direction? When we asked our independent schools what they want, they say, don't change anything, hands off, give us our space. And I think that's something that we need to tackle. Um, it's one of the issues that we continue to avoid when we consider education reform and costs rise to educate all students, but public schools are told to make cuts. The data on student outcomes is not up to date. 
nor does it share how our public and independent school student outcomes are similar or different. What is clear is that there are two different systems. The funding is commingled. The allowed use of the funding is vastly different. It was a small issue when we had four academies in many public schools, but we continue to increase the amount of funding going to independent schools since 2020. And we haven't adjusted any controls on how those funds can be used, or are we tracking if our students are better served in this system? When we make changes, we have to start here with the fact that we have two very different systems that have very different implementation requirements and inadequate data to manage, to understand how we're impacting students. So I'm gonna go back to the fact that we need a statewide vision with clear outcomes for schools, for <clears throat> students. We need to take our dual system ed education where we fund public and independent schools with the same tax dollars and figure out how we do that with best practices. How do we get students ready in the 21st century when we have a system that dates back to the 19th century? And we really have to change the way we look at that. What do we want? How do we want to do that? And then use our tax policy where we can influence behavior to focus on that system and how we're going to make sure that we achieve those goals. I really want to make sure that we're not acting for the sake of taking action this year and that we're not doing any additional harm because schools have been tugged and pulled as Paul have heard in so many different directions this year and they can't keep just responding. They have to have clear goals and outcomes and be able to look to the future and figure out how they can best educate students. <clears throat> All right, Representative Roberts. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Tristan Roberts. I represent Halifax, Whitingham, and Wilmington. I'm really grateful for this opportunity with the committees. My constituents, uh, most, you know, their, their biggest topic for me is their local schools, and I often just have to tell them, talk to your school boards. Um, so being here today is great, and I appreciate it. Um, and I just want to take a minute and voice some of the realities from my district. Uh, plenty of my constituents, frankly, wouldn't mind seeing our high school close. They have quality concerns. They have the taxes are high since Act 60. Um, they feel that the school is shrinking anyway. There used to be two rival baseball teams, as they point out. Now they can't field one. Um, and then that leads to more attrition. That kid who was coming to school through sports fills up. Um, so you could come in and make a rational argument, and I'm not going to say I'm speaking for all my constituents by any means, but you can make a rational argument that the district of this size with its facilities, with the student population, should focus on having a great middle school, maybe even merging that with another town, then giving choice for high school. Uh, so if we did have choice, closed our high school, some of those kids would then be an hour away from Brattleboro Union High School over Hogback, Route 9. Uh, it's not good in the winter. Um, and some kids love BUHS, but for some, it's not a great fit. So choice, I've got choice for some. A lot of kids in my district are really happy um, going to Franklin Tech in Massachusetts, Northfield, Mount Hermon, Academy of Charlemont, uh, and yeah, even Grace Christian School in Bennington. So could closing the high school or looking at merging middle schools reduce costs and help us focus on meeting kids early and getting them where they need to be? Maybe. Speaking from my one district, I would invite the school to look at consolidation. I'd uh, be in favor, my thought was do a blue ribbon panel, like the federal base closure, really nonpartisan, except what they tell us kind of panel, but make these hard strategic choices and then reinvest in local culture. And we have some success on that. Uh, when Wilmington consolidated with Whitingham, they uh, took, they built a high school in Whitingham and then took the old high school downtown in Wilmington, was left empty and now over time, that's becoming a real resource for the town where uh, two ends of the population scale are getting great services with uh, pickleball for seniors being really popular. Uh, there's a great daycare uh, that's now expanded thanks to Act 76. Um, there's office space, there's local organizations. 
Taxpayers sometimes scratch their heads. Uh, so the school district walked away from this building because it was too expensive and now the town's carrying it anyway. Um, so uh, we should be careful about just pushing costs into other ledgers. Um, and you know, I think there have been some great points about participation in school budgets. People don't participate in the school budget process. Maybe we should look at that more on a state level uh, and just say, hey, this state is the level at which that is feasible to look at and where people are engaged with Montpelier. They're sending out some message, even though it's local control. Um, a lot of my constituents are aging out of their homes. And they know that sooner or later, they can't age in place, but they would love to stay in at least the same town they spent their whole lives in. So could we take that old high school, convert it to more housing, more pickleball, business incubator, there's a bond to deal with that. So again, the state could deal with this kind of thing in a way that uniquely we couldn't locally. We don't have the tools to look at that locally. Paying for it all, uh, I'd like to see all our committees look at economic development at the town level, something we don't always do. To say, look, maybe this town's demographics are no longer fit for having this high school, but again, the senior housing, childcare, Local machine shop, you know, looking for space. Maybe they want to take over that shop building, give jobs for, for local high school graduates. You know, it was really compelling to hear that 45% of our high school grads are not pursuing higher ed. So as we look at the state on a systems level, let's look at those dead ends in our systems and forge new connections. And we could do more with less and even grow our economies. Um, just I want to offer, and this relates to my committee, correction and in institutions, school construction, we know something about that um, in our committee. And I'd love to talk more with anyone interested about things like standardized prefab construction with standardized designs, really human scale, good designs that could be built in Vermont prefab manufacturing facilities. This is this set of strategies is one of the few ways um, that this, the design and construction industry could contain costs or even bring down costs. Um, looking at school construction statewide and a $6 billion market for that, um, we could make our own market um, with some new Vermont-based manufacturing facilities for that. Um, but as I wrap up here, I wanna come back to quality. Again, in the eyes of some constituents, there's, I would honest, be honest, there's not a loyalty to the public school system, either sending kids into it or sending tax dollars into it. Um, and I think we'd be talking less about cost if people are really happy with quality. And this also hurts us and hurts our kids. We can't protect our kids from discrimination. Um, when constituents, even for whom they don't like to see tax dollars going to schools that discriminate, but if that's a collateral cost of a free choice system, some are willing to make that bargain. Um, and I think that's very unfortunate and very concerning, but I want to voice that these you know, appetites are real out there. Um, and it reflects that we're in danger of giving up on our constitution and giving up on our values. And again, I'm trying to report the zeitgeist of the district. I want to be clear, I have my, myself and many of my constituents are strong supporters of the public school system. Um, one of my constituents is uh, former representative David Larson, the former chair of education and uh, many other important uh, roles. And he encouraged me to support 43 in the strongest possible form. So I want to thank the committee for their hard work on that bill. Um, I know there are major problems and this isn't easy, but I just want to encourage us to think talk hard about choice, think big about meeting our kids where they're at and stick with them. Um, and specific suggestions in closing, I'm excited about BOCES and, and I've personally been a beneficiary of BOCES program in New York State where I um, went to public school. Um, consolidation by a blue ribbon panel, economic development, looking at towns and quality. As John Dewey, uh, Vermont resident um, said, we teach today's students the way we taught yesterday's, we rob them of tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, folks, maybe we'll take uh, a very quick uh, eight minute break while we await the arrival of some more of our speakers. So let's be back in our seats. Uh, by 1010. Welcome back to our joint meeting of House Ways and Means and House Education. And we are continuing uh, hearing from our colleagues on um, our education system, education finance, uh, with what they're hearing and what their suggestions are. We are welcoming Representative Hank.
Good morning, committees. Representative Lisa Hango, Franklin 5, for the record. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm here today with a very simple message. I represent three school districts and one supervisory union across my legislative district. And I share those with not only my district mate, but three other legislative district representatives. I'm also a school board member in one of those districts. To speak in blanket statements about our region's schools may seem improbable, but in this case, I feel that I represent all of them with my sentiments. If you look at a statewide graph, we are among the lowest spending districts in the state. My district's proposed spending in this budget cycle is $9,900 per student. We continually hold spending increases to a minimum and have not had a budget fail in a very long time. This year, due to the publicized tax project projections, our budgets were uniformly defeated. We faced the very hard work of trying to cut budgets that were already near their bones. Our informational sessions are just beginning as we attempt to educate the public on how close we are to the $1 tax rate, which means that any cuts below that rate will start sending revenue directly to the statewide fund. Our boards looked long and carefully at spending cuts. And even though we had very little left to cut, we made a good faith effort to implement difficult cuts, including those affecting public safety in our schools. I'm here to call for higher spending districts to follow our lead and cut their budgets. With the current statewide formula remaining in place, those high spending districts that continue to spend because they can will cause our property taxes to rise, even as our ability to provide services to students declines. It is imperative for all voters to understand how their spending across the state in all districts affects all taxpayers, and ultimately all students. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Representative McCoy is up next. Morning. Good morning. For the record, Representative Patty McCoy, representing Rutland, which is in the western part of Rutland County, representing Pulte, Ira, and a little part of Wells west of Route 30, which is Lake St. Catherine. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. And for the record, I'm going to be channeling former Representative Larry Cookley and State One School District. Uh -huh. We, uh, our current student population probably hangs around 75 to 80,000 students statewide, which is pretty much what the city of Providence, Rhode Island has student population. I know that we need to increase our student population in this state, but we can't do that because the number one reason is housing. So we have a lot of issues to solve and the housing before we can increase the student population. We have issues of uh, lower student te teacher ratios in our school. I know in Pulteney, when my children went to school, the average class size was 24 to 26 students. Today, it hangs around 12 to 15. And we have not reduced teachers, any teachers staff no teacher staff or, or um, you know, individual assist, I don't know what they're calling them now, paraprofessionals. I think we've increased the paraprofessional population in our school district. Um, we need to cap spending. I, I have no magic wand to tell you that like, this is it. I have the solution. I do not. There are far more intelligent people working on that, but I do know we somehow need to cap spending. And from my perspective, my district, my supervisor union 
has done everything that the state has demanded of them, beginning with Act 60, Act 46, Act 173. Our increase in our budget for this year that was passed in March was 1.57%. And then I have to tell these taxpayers that their increase in their property taxes is going to be double digit. When they only increased 1.57%, I cannot ask any more than the school, what the, that supervisory union did. And yet, I have to go back and say, well, you know, because we pool everybody's money and everyone else spent $241 million, you now have to chip in for what they, when, when my school district does what's asked of them, they should not be punished because other schools have gone way beyond 18%, 20% increases, and you're penalizing my supervisory union. I do know that what we do, we need to make the decision based on what is best for our children and our students. Uh, you know, I, I'm not an educator. You know, I did the best with my three daughters and they are fine, upstanding members, all went on to higher ed, all have well-paying jobs. I know we need to do that, but um, I don't know what the solution is. I do know that the current formula is way too complex for any average citizen or even many of us in this room today to even understand. So it needs to be less complicated and it needs to be, you know, as a school district treasurer and supervisory union treasurer for 26 years, there's a huge disconnect between what happens at a school budget and when people receive their property taxes because you, you give the credit right then to individuals. So there's this disconnect when they go, oh, that's not bad. My school taxes aren't bad because those lower income individuals are receiving that credit immediately on their tax bill. There's a disconnect when they go to the polls when that happens. So that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you very much. We have Representative Walker here. Yeah, oh, great, welcome. We should have walked over together. I know, you wore the right shoes. <laughs> I actually forgot that I had snowed. <laughs> Big surprise. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let's see, I am just going to read something that I prepared. It seems like the best way to get my points across. So. Um, Give us a, an introduction. And then... Yeah, so I am Kate Lally. I represent the town of Shelburne. Um, Chittenden 6 is my district. And I wanted to thank, thank you for this opportunity to comment on education financing. So um, everything that we do in government is shaped by public perceptions around our ability to balance services with affordability uh, for constituents. And the message that um, I am hearing from my constituents is that we're failing at this. Um, we all recognize that certain students cost more to educate than others and are committed to ensuring a quality education for Vermont students. The revised equalized student formula from Act 127, coupled with desire for districts to retain the services they become accustomed to, must be balanced against the loss of pand pandemic era funding and the true costs of local control. Um, this has meant no investment in facilities, no accountability for outcomes for the kids in the districts and significant redundant administration, all in a context where the school population is declining each year, particularly, um, I believe this is the case in, in rural Vermont. So as the rollout of equalized student adjustments proceeds, it should be paired with strong incentives to rein in spending statewide. The community school shared services model is a really important first step towards efficient and more cost-effective delivery of many essential services at scale. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing um, how this rolls out. The weighting measures in Act 127 do not take it into account cost of living differences across the state. The median uh, housing price in Chittenden County is 60% higher than the statewide median. 
and is two to three times that of our rural counties. This is playing itself out in what districts need to pay um, every staff person. So we need a more balanced view of the actual educational cost distribution across the state. We all want equal, equality of opportunity for our kids. Formulas in Act 127 are not reflective of cost realities. In the CVS, CVSD district, which is my district, district staffing costs are approximately 80% of the budget. Driving up salaries for staff are employee shortages as the work in schools becomes more challenging. And in Shelburne, a median uh, home cost is now $734,000, if you can believe that. At the same time, we have rising costs for heat, transportation, and to maintain um, fraying infrastructure. Shelburne is revising its zoning to encourage more housing by increasing density and balancing cars and transit, but building housing in the quantities needed in our region is going to take time. We already have among the highest cumulative tax rates in the country, so we need to focus as a state on where we see the returns on investment if we're going to ask ever more of our taxpayers. To benchmark what's a sustainable level of statewide spending, uh, to look at outcomes in some other states seems informative. Uh, we spend 22% more per student um, in Vermont than New Hampshire or Maine, um, and without necessarily better educational outcomes. This is just a brief look at some of the Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education data. Um, this is coming at the time we are spending very near the bottom nationwide in school facilities, which is you know we're accumulating an ever larger deficit in this area. So just to wrap up, um, the dollars that we invest in education are those that we aren't investing in other needs, drug treatment, climate mitigation, affordable housing, walkable and bikeable communities, and other worthy investments. So when we look at ed, ed, ed spending reform, I think it needs to be undertaken in the context of balancing it against these other pressing needs. And I'm done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, you were right yeah. my blind spot. Sorry. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. For the record, uh, my name is Elizabeth Burroughs, and I represent Windsor One, which is uh, composed of Heartland, West Windsor, and Windsor. And for full disclosure, I am a 10 plus uh, year um, member of our local school board, Mount Escutney School Board, which I have been on since um, it was a three member board of West Windsor only. Um, uh, and I want to start by thanking you all for this, the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you this morning. I have had this opportunity burning inside of me since uh, January 10th. Oh, thank you for, for uh, allowing me to finally speak. Uh, uh, what successful business model uh, includes the requirement to annually deplete treasure from its base investment into a blind entity with zero accountability for use of funds success, treatment of employees, quality of output, or adherence to law. In what successful business does that happen to the sheer and sometimes total detriment of the accountable entities, which are cannibalized in service to the blind entity? But education is not a business and should not be treated as one. I'll start by stating the obvious. Uh, 
that we must restructure our education system and support the education committee's decisions and actions with the ways and the means. <laughs> this, <laughs> this must include a full examination of our tuitioning structure. It must. It is perverse that in districts with small schools all across our state this year, painful decisions are being made even toward, with an eye towards closure uh, uh, to starve the beast with cuts staff programming, sapping a common good in favor of supporting entities with zero accountability, uh, it, with zero accountability in budgeting or in quality or in treatment of the town's most promising investment. It's perverse. But speaking of public uh, of promising investments, I beg you to call for an economic analysis of the real long-term state impact of school closures. Setting aside any immediate savings of the first five years, please consider the impact over 20 to 30 years to the state's taxing capacity when a town dies as a result of school closure. When services die out because the town has converted to minority homesteaders, it affects our taxing capability. When second homeowners convert to retirees for whom services cannot be provided, when people move out of our state instead of in because young families don't want to move to a state that has diminished its public school system, when students who don't go to school in their own towns statistically wind up costing the state in support services as adults, all of these details have real economic impact on our whole state. Right now, at this moment, the means of funding education is regressive. When towns like Heartland, uh, which had a more than 30% rise in property taxes this year and a budget that just passed by nine votes, uh, when towns like Heartland have five expensive home purchases take place in the year of valuation, it skews the grand list upwards. The CLA is supposed to create equity but it is not currently functioning properly. In a housing market such as the one we are in, it is regressive. It is regressive for the grand list to become skewed and it's regressive for modest homes to become skewed in their valuation as an equal result. One of my suggestions is to offset the CLA for this year and next with an end date certain by adding another portion of the property transfer tax because that is directly related to the cause of the problem, the current problem. Another idea is to look closely at the CLA formula to, to consider annual sales, to consider annual sales uh, in a way that removes the highest and lowest outliers. Likewise, and this is uh, uh, input from several constituents, rejiggering the common use formula to include a different tier, a different tier for out of state owners who've been buying up large tracts of land would provide a small but meaningful relief. And uh, also from a number of constituents, adjusting income sensitivity to be in line with our economic condition, our current economic conditions would also provide another small but meaningful modicum of relief. And I've also heard from a number of constituents, both as a representative and as a school board member, um, uh, people would like to be able to understand exactly where their taxes are going. So I already talked about um, transparency as far as uh, where, where tuition funds are going and whether they're actually, what they're funding and whether they're funding uh, quality, but, um, They've also asked to offload non-educational expenditures like mental health, which has been, all these have been already um, mentioned, but offloading expenditures such as uh, uh, mental health, teacher health care costs, since they're negotiated by the governor, social work, universal school meals, and enrollment. This would make it clear to school boards what element of their budget process uh, they're actually able to address, and it would make it clear to taxpayers feeling the pain of increases what they're paying for. Mm -hmm. along... We're at six minutes, FYI. Oh, we are? <laughs> we have another minute and a half left. Is that all right? Quickly, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Same money, same, same adherence to accountability. One of our, one of the greatest public goods has been purposefully weakened, but, and this is important, we have everything we need to fix it. We do. We just need the time and space to be able to gather input and wisdom and importantly, courage. With the right administrative leader who has experience in working to draw down federal funding, adhere to federal and state law, and work to fix a system instead of replacing it, driven by fairness, quality, and equitable outcomes, and apolitical, as all of education should be, we have the inputs and creativity we really need to fix what we have. Using the probing equity questions provided by the Social Equity Caucus in the last two years, we can ask ourselves whether every student is being treated fairly and getting what they need. We can stop discounting or overcoming districts where human rights and dignity are trampled. We can be courageous and look right at the problem and fix it. One of the reasons I have loved serving on the board for more than a decade is that education is one of the very few remaining areas of public life that is theoretically apolitical. All across our great nation, we see people of all parties working collaboratively and creatively to shore up our greatest asset and investment in our collective future. When I started work at our local school board, I had no idea of the political affiliation of my colleagues. We all had hands on the same rock. We can get back there. We can purposefully set aside our politics and remember that our job is to protect and foster the greatness of every child in our care. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Representative Arsenault, you are up next. Welcome. Thank you, Alan. Um, I have not cleaned this, so I'll speak quickly. Thank you, everyone. Uh, for the record, Angela Arsenault, representative from Williston. So I first want to say that I'm a proud graduate of Vermont Public Schools. My experience as a student both in the North Country and Randolph school systems is part of the reason I knew that no matter where I went after high school, I would eventually come back to Vermont so that my kids could go to school here. Whether it was the multi-grade primary unit class I was in from first through third grade, the incredible dance program at North Country, and one of my favorite educational experiences of all time, senior project at Randolph Union High School. Even as a kid, it was clear to me that good things were happening in Vermont public schools. That brand of magic is still happening in schools throughout our state, despite the fact that our system and many of the people who make up that system are in crisis. I have experienced this current crisis from a somewhat interesting, though not altogether unique perspective, that of legislator and school board member. I know how it feels when a school board spends years planning for a gigantic shift in education funding, only to have the legislation changed, not at the last minute, but in fact, after you've already warned your budget. Over the years, I've been in multiple meetings where folks are blaming Montpelier for the unsustainable increase in taxes or the bungled rollout of e-finance and Act 173, the absolute mess of a switch to a new statewide assessment, the mandated change to proficiency-based education without the necessary supports, the list goes on and on. So many decisions made in rooms like this one having such significant effects on the people inside our schools and the volunteer school boards working to support them. Because of this perspective, I must borrow from the Hippocratic Oath and impress upon us all the intense need to first do no harm. Please do not think about making the important and necessary changes ahead without a clear understanding of who and what will be impacted. And please do not simply rely on past experience or the agency of education or tax modeling to predict that impact. Talk to the people who will feel the changes most immediately, our students, caregivers, teachers, administrators, support staff, school counselors, and our taxpayers. These voices together can help us re-envision a statewide educational system that starts with a dream for every student in Vermont. Once we have a handle on that dream, we can figure out how to fund it. 
It cannot happen the other way around. We must lead with education policy and let the funding formula follow. Speaking of that formula, whatever happens next, we need it to be more transparent. In our laudable and constitutionally mandated efforts to be super, super equitable, we have created an educational funding system that is so opaque as to be deceptive. Nobody is trying to be untruthful, but when we work so hard to hide the fact that some districts pay more into the system than they spend, there is virtually no connection between an individual taxpayer, their tax rate, and an understanding of what their money funds. Similarly, we've severed the connection between districts, their spending, and the resulting tax rates in their respective towns. This is evidenced by our school district, Champlain Valley. Our second warned budget, because our original budget failed, represents a 5.8 increase in spending from FY24, well below the statewide average. Yet our tax rates are estimated to increase between 10 and 18% across our five towns. Our failed budget required tax rate increases between 21 and 30%. Reducing the tax rate increases required our administrators to cut 42 full-time equivalent positions. 42 positions. And I'll note that we now face a potential second failed budget because our community members are so upset about the cuts that are being proposed. School districts are in an impossible situation. We've also created a system that allows such incredible leakage of taxpayer dollars that we've essentially lost track of what's coming out of the education fund. How many taxpayers know that their money goes to independent schools, some of which dis discriminate against students of various backgrounds? How many Vermonters understand that school districts are paying for a number of social services, most notably mental health services for students? At a recent school board meeting, our district superintendent shared a quote that feels particularly relevant to this conversation. Economist and composer W. Edwards Deming said that every system produces the outcome that it was designed to produce. Our current funding system was designed to be confusing, and it is, and that has to change. So what can we do in the near term to clear up some of this confusion and provide immediate relief to taxpayers? <laughs> I understand the cloud tax is currently written into the yield bill, and I think that will help if it's sustainable. But please don't buy down the tax rate as we have in the past couple of years. Artificially suppressing tax rates contributed to the massive tax rate increase that helped defeat dozens of school budgets this year. And to that point, we need to have a plan for districts that don't pass a budget. I don't presume to know where the help could come from, but I do know that school districts have cut and cut and cut, and third attempts to pass a budget will have disastrous impacts on students. We need to plan for something better than the statutorily allowed loan of 87% of a district's most recently passed budget. Finally, about the yield. It makes no sense that we ask voters to vote on a best guess tax rate. We can make changes on timing that will again increase transparency and make clear for voters that every district's budget impacts the entire state. I acknowledge I haven't offered a lot of solutions here. My overarching and deeply held belief is that we will likely have to ride out this disaster for FY25, learn all that we can and make small changes to provide some relief in FY26, then celebrate a beautiful new cohesive statewide vision for education and education funding in FY27. One that takes into account the problematic nature of Vermont's parallel systems of public and private institutions. One that embraces the notion of same dollars, same rules. One that acknowledges that numbers do not always tell the full story of need. And one that centers student opportunities and achievement. A statewide system that points all schools and districts toward a set of common goals that best utilize available resources. With your leadership and the magic of Vermont Public Schools, I truly believe we can get there. Representative Stebbins, <laughs> you're up. Representative Stebbins, can you hear us? There we go. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry, I was not hearing anything. Uh, I can begin? Yes. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to speak today. For the record, I am Gabrielle Stebbins, and I represent Chittenden 13 or the South End area of Burlington. For context, I have a 14-year-old and a six-year-old currently in the public school system. 
While my 14 year old has no special needs, my six year old has needed additional support and is on an IEP as a result of being deaf due to having not identified the need for tubes uh, from when she was 14 months to 22 months old. I witnessed firsthand the stressors placed on our public school system writ large and as they relate to the city of Burlington specifically. I implore you to take this moment of crisis regarding how we pay for education and in particular public education and slow down, step back and collect as much data and intel as possible. We have a phenomenal opportunity to respond to this challenge in a strategic, comprehensive way. Thus, I encourage you to focus on the systems work that really needs to occur. Lead with systems and then follow up with funding. Ideally, uh, I would love to see the Education Committee be able to really focus on policy, identify what's working, what's not, take the input from experts and the many, many reports that we've had over the last 10 years to identify the following. What is the size of the system? What are our estimated demographics moving forward? How many buildings do we have? How many people? Has consolidation resulted in reduced costs? Is it an opportunity to move forward? For the Agency of Education, we know that the uh, nonpartisan uh, National Association of State Board of Education based in DC actually recommends that the governance structure for education not be located within the executive branch. Um, before uh, Governor Shumlin, it was, it was located outside. So let's actually step back, take a look. Uh, does that make sense to revisit where AOE is located? What is the leadership? What is its scope? And is the role of that scope well-defined? Are they able to provide it? Is it adequately funded and staffed? I do think we really need to look at designation and tuitioning. Um, what are we looking at in terms of the same dollars, the same rules? Financial oversight of independent schools, from what I understand, and I don't have any children in independent schools, um, it's, it's relatively absent. Privatization and operating a dual system does contribute to financial losses. And I want to just call out, uh, as someone who's had siblings with dyslexia and learning disabilities, sending those, sending my brother and sister to private school was critical for my parents. But we do need to focus on making sure that we respond adequately with the appropriate funding for public education first. What is it that schools are currently being asked to do that could really be considered social services and perhaps be funded as such? And what can we do outside of our education domain that can really reduce some of the challenges that our public schools are facing? I can't tell you the number of times my daughter comes home and she talks about the kids who um, you know, beat up other kids outside of her school, the fact that she doesn't want to go into the bathroom because of the vaping. These are things, or, or the social media uh, and, and the relation to depression. These are the things that um, collectively, and I'm so great, you, grateful that you have a joint session right now. Collectively, I know that the folks on the Education Committee and so many experts outside of our building at the State House, they are very fully aware of all of these challenges. How do we make sure we're really funding education? and education needs with our education dollars and other funding sources that address mental health, other issues should be funded separately. I know you've heard this already, um, the CLA mechanism um, designed to ensure equitable property tax rates across the state, it has inadvertently contributed to significant disparities in education funding. Uh, and so really revisiting that, I'm grateful to Act 127 and the fact that it really did focus on addressing waiting. This is huge. It's been 20 plus years. Please let's focus on how we make sure that we are actually meeting the hands and meeting the challenges at need. It's also critical to emphasize that the transition relief provided to districts that have been historically overweighted it could be considered, uh, at least in my district, to exceed what should reasonably be required. So revisiting that and, and stepping back, I understand how challenging it is having friends uh, and family in other districts where they're seeing um, you know, losses of potential funding. 
But this is, again, going back to big picture. What are the systems challenges we need to focus on? Uh, in terms of healthcare, um, at, as a very short-term fix, looking at the miscellaneous education bill, we, we could actually look at um, the requirement uh, to assess cost containment um, for uh, healthcare uh, required costs. Um, and in school construction, there's definitely an urgent need to consider the implications of school construction costs, particularly for districts like mine. Um, again, I'm really focused on what can we do for all of Vermont, um, but I would be remiss if I did not um, just highlight that this is clearly an issue across the state and trying to figure out how to make it as equitable across the state is necessary. Uh, and with that, I'll close off. I do have other comments, but I'm not sure if I'm at six minutes. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, Representative Morgan. Welcome. Good morning, committees. Good morning. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Mine's very brief. It won't take six minutes. Um, I'll start off with, I'm not the expert. I don't have the answers, like several others I've heard say. Um, so I'm simply here to send a message from my constituents as the biggie. Um, first, from a couple of my school boards, and I know there's a couple, there, these things have probably been brought up to you already, but I'm probably uh, going to be a bit of a broken record. But I know in the, in the state system for healthcare for educators, we do have a program in place but I know that it always, every system can use improvement. And the school boards, a couple of school boards asked me to just bring that forward, that are we looking at potentially improving that system as a, a cost savings measure coupled with, um, and again, probably a broken record, but statewide teachers contract. Is there, you know, move afoot or an appetite to look at that um, on behalf of taxpayers? Does that help level the playing field a bit on these budgets so that, because as we all know, those eat up a very good chunk of your school budgets and does that assist us. So they asked if I would pass it on again. It's probably been said, but I wanted to state it on their behalf. Um, so really what I'm here to say though, is here's, here's my ask or my message. Um, as probably many of you have had over the last several months, especially when the, when the budget numbers came out on school budgets um, with the very high numbers, one of my towns in the 35% range, um, is just to is my phone texting face-to-face -face conversations are innumerable and and people are saying we're hurting so i have six towns i represent all of grand isle county and and the town of milton um i'm a selectman in the town of milton we busted our backsides to hold the line on our town budget this year knowing especially the fact that the school was going to be hurting for uh, and we did, and that got passed. And actually, I think it's a sign of the times, though, because it didn't pass by what I thought it would, with it only being less than a 3% increase. I think people were fearful in general when they saw the education numbers coupled with that. Um, so I kind of felt very lucky to be a selectman versus a school board member because they had an, not an enviable task in front of them presenting these budgets to everybody this year. Um, so the message I'm here to bring from my constituents is let's do something this session, even if it's this big, if it's ready to vote with their by marching out with their boots and not attempt um we need them here we need their revenue we, we need their tax base we need them we want them to stay vermonters we want to keep them here um but they look at the bottom line because they have to that's how they make their existence how they make their living um one of them especially uh i'd say is very capable of folding up their tent and going away and will be fine financially but feels that they offer a service to the community they want to keep offering. And so I applaud them for that. I hope they stay. I hope we can keep it so that they do stay. Um, so again, uh, I don't need the six minutes, but I just, 
I, I don't have the answers. I'm not the smartest person in the room in this world, but I know uh, that I, I've not promised them because I can't promise them, but I said that I would bring forward the fact that let's do something for them to give them a sign. I don't know if that is crazy to y'all, and I'm not trying to sound alarmist. I'm just being, I think, a realist of what I'm seeing out there. And um, yeah, I'll just leave it right there. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. That <laughs> so did I. Yeah. Uh, should we let's take, take five? Break. Yeah. Let's take uh, five minutes and hopefully our uh, final speaker will be coming at that point. Welcome back to this uh, joint meeting between House Ways and Means and House Education. Uh, we are at our final scheduled speaker, um, but just so the committees know, after that, we have a couple of presentations from Ledge Council and Joint Fiscal. Uh, so that's what that's what we will be continuing on with after this. Representative Noyes, welcome. We look forward to your testimony. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, when I heard they have, um, you were taking some tests, different ideas around education, uh, made me think of a bill that I had put in back in 2018, uh, which is H. 861. Um, I have a copy of it. There's a couple things now that are like pretty outdated. Um, but the general idea is that um, right now, um, 51 supervisory unions, there's 17 uh, career and technical career CTEs. Um, and so my thought was, is to redraw the supervisory unions around the CTEs. And um, so you would have basically uh, 17 supervisory unions, but then I wanted to add one in um, for youth in the custody of the state. So uh, originally I was concerned about youth at Woodside. Of course, that doesn't exist anymore. So if you look at 861, it does address that, but we do have a number of youth that are housed in out-of-state programs or in different um, residential treatment programs. So I thought having a supervisory union that was really focused in on their education, um, you know, while they're in a treatment program would be would be important as well. So basically what this does is just reduce the number of supervisory unions from 51 down to 17 and then add an additional one for youth in the custody of the state. Um, this bill kind of goes through how to how to get there. Um, like I said, some of it probably is um, outdated, but the general idea was just as a way to um, kind of reduce some costs around around that. Um, you know, and also one of the thoughts was, you know, um, having supervisory unions um, that are, don't have a career and technical center, when you send a child there, um, you know, obviously the money goes with it. So um, it was just really strengthening our CTEs and, and making sure that uh, if that's a career path, that that would be, um, taken into account for that individual based on their needs, which I'm sure it is, but just it wouldn't, the money wouldn't leave the supervisory because that would be the supervisory. So that's it. That's what I got for you. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate the time. And uh, I'll leave you a talk. Well, I can look it up anyways. All right. You can send it to Sorcha. That would be great. I sure will. All right. Thanks. thanks Have a great day. I'll try to be fast. Yeah. <laughs> You're also the first person to bring up CTEs, I think. Pardon me? You're, I think you were the first person to bring up CT. Yeah, good okay. idea. <laughs> um, so, committees, thank you for all of that deep listening. Um, I think we've all taken notes. Maybe at some point we can all compare our notes. Really, um, some new ideas, some people canceling out each other's ideas, which is great to have other people do that instead of us doing that ourselves. Glad that we've been able to do this. Um, we have some testimony prepared from Julia Richter from Joint Fiscal Office, and then um, some testimony from Beth from Legislative Council. And we're going to start with Julia, who um, is going to share some slides with us inside the computer um, about essentially like what is this situation we find ourselves in today in a historical context. Um, in terms of tax rates and a few pieces like that. Her testimony is posted. It has been updated while we've been talking. So um, please refresh your browser window if you already have it open. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Julia. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, good morning. For the record, I'm Julia Richter with the Joint Fiscal Office. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, great. Um, sorry to be remote. I am stuck at home due to the storm, so hoping that my power stays on and we can get through all of this. Um, as the chair mentioned, there are some slides under my name on the committee page. Would you like me to share my screen? I think that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Can you all see my screen okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so, so yeah, as the chair mentioned, I was asked to put together um, some slides regarding ed finance in Vermont over time and sort of what is the, what is the picture in which we're in now and we have been in. I will walk through, there's just a bunch of charts that I've put together. Um, I do want to note that Unless otherwise mentioned, and I will, I will, will keep bringing this up. All of the numbers are adjusted for inflation, so we can really see an apples to apples comparison. So you might not recognize necessarily all of the numbers that showed up last year or the year before, and that's because they've been adjusted for inflation by NEEP. Um, so first, starting out on education fund revenues and property taxes, I put together some charts to see what this has looked like historically over time. So this first um, first chart that we've got here is looking at education fund revenues over time since 2009. So we're seeing here on the x-axis, the fiscal year starting in 2009 and then up to 2025 current forecast. Um, I pulled these from the, the 2025 forecast is representing what I presented to this committee, these committees um, last week in joint testimony. So of course it doesn't reflect um, necessarily what's going to happen because as we all know, the yield bill has not been set nor has it been passed. So what we're seeing um, really these green bars are adjusted for inflation and this is reflecting property taxes. And then we see the, on top of that, the additional revenue sources in the education fund, the general fund transfer, um, was done away with after fiscal year 2017. grown over time. Maybe to the same scale that um, we were expecting pre, pre adjustment for inflation. Julia? Can you yes. hear me? Mm -hmm. Your video, you're um, getting a little garbled. I wonder if you could turn off your video and then um, start. Oh, it's our internet. Oh, maybe it's your, I don't know what I'm first. If you um, could then start the slide from the beginning. Okay. And please um, feel free to interrupt me. My, um, my camera is off. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Great. So starting here, um, interrupt me if I get choppy again, but what we're looking at here are real ed fund revenue sources over time from 2009 to forecasted for 2025. So we're seeing on the X axis, the fiscal year, and we're seeing on the Y axis, the ed fund revenues adjusted for inflation. Can you hear me better? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so, th so the green bars are property taxes. We can see the net homestead property tax is dark green here. That's including the property tax credit subtracted out. And then the light green bar being the non homestead property tax. We can also see that in, um, 2018 fiscal year, 2018, the general fund transfer, this is when it was done away with, um, and picked up by that increase in the other revenue sources flowing directly into the education fund. Again, um, these, these figures are adjusted for inflation. I've brought all of the dollars um, to $2020 using the NEEP index, which is what we typically use in ed finance, um, which is why it doesn't necessarily have the same curve that you would you would see if you were to just be plotting the, the nominal dollars over time. Um, question for you. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks for this, Julia. Really cool to see um, it all in this way. And I'm, I'm looking at 2022 and 2023, and there's a decline in revenue. And I'm wondering whether that reflects a decline in total ed spending, or is there another category of funding like ESSER that isn't included in this chart, but um, sort of uh, made up for um, for added additional revenue that isn't reflected on this chart? Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. So this is um, this is reflecting only statewide education dollars. So it's not reflecting any federal dollars. I don't know. Um, I haven't I haven't compared this to federal dollars, so I can't speak with certainty if it is in fact ESSER that's accounting for this dip. But that would make sense given the fact that this is the pandemic. Um, the pandemic, we had the the large swath of ESSER funds coming into the state. So this is reflecting what's coming out of the statewide education fund. Yeah, Representative Beck. Hey, Julia, can you give us a sense? I mean, I, I can see the change just visually, but what's the value of the bar in 2009? And what's the value of the bar in 2025? What's the, what's the growth there? from uh, in a number, um, so what's the value of the growth? Do you know that? Um, I don't know that, but I can certainly get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, back to you, Julia. Okay, um, so, so moving forward, the next slide or, or chart that I prepared was showing just the property taxes, because that's what we've been talking about so much. So the again, this is adjusted for inflation. These are the same green bars that we were just looking at. But this is the real education property tax over time. And then I've overlaid it with the long-term average daily membership. So, so really, how many kids are in schools? So we can see that after adjusting for inflation, um, relatively constant, um, maybe a slight uptick here. Um, over time, and we're seeing a steady decline in pupils in the state. Sh moving you. forward, unless I, um, nope, you're good. Are there any questions? So this is this next chart is the nominal equalized tax rates over time. So this has not these tax rates have not been adjusted for inflation. I've plotted what we are seeing here again is fiscal year. So this is going back to 2012 and this is the equalized tax rate. So our light blue, this is the homestead average equalized rate. We know that that varies by community um, and the dark blue being the non-homestead uniform equalized tax rate. So this is pre-CLA, that's what equalized means. Um, and, and so I really want to note here that while we can look at the the change or um, relatively steady parts of this chart in terms of the equalized tax rates over time. This is not getting at the total tax bills or tax liability, right? Because a tax bill is comprised of two components. It's the tax rate, also the value of the property where the, where the CLA fits in, right? Because CLA is really just adjusting for the, um, the value of the property so that everyone is being taxed at their fair share. Um, so what we're looking at here is the, the equalized tax rates over time before accounting for grant list growth um, and values and properties across the state. Now, one way to think about how tax liability has changed over time. Instead of thinking about tax rates, we can think about, again, how much is being raised on property taxes. So here I have, again, these are the same green bars that we looked at in the prior two graphs. But here I've also adjusted the um, property tax rates for inflation. So what we see is that when adjusting the property tax rates for inflation, they are decreasing, but that does not mean that the overall tax liability, the overall amount that people are paying in property taxes is decreasing over time.
Is everyone, Julia's pausing for questions and people are making puzzled faces. Does yeah, anyone want to ask we Julia need more explanation? Can you, Can you just, just talk longer about, about that? Yeah, say that again in a different way. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, sorry. Normally I would uh, like to be able to be there to uh, see if people need more explanation. So I appreciate the verbal cues. Um, so really what we're looking at here, these green bars are the same green bars that we have been looking at in the prior graphs, right? This is reflecting the amount that's raised in property tax revenues. So we've got the dark green being the net homestead property tax. So that's including the, the property tax credit and the amount being raised in non-homestead revenues, the light green. So that's one way of getting at how much is being raised on property taxes. What are people paying in property taxes and this is being adjusted for inflation. So after taking out increases in inflation, what's being raised on property? So that's what we're seeing here in the green bars. Now we just looked on the prior slide about tax rates. And often, you know, we talk about increases in tax rates or decreases in tax rates. And so what I thought might be helpful is trying to put an image to the fact that tax rates are just one piece of the puzzle of a tax bill. The other piece of the puzzle being property value. So what we're seeing here is that tax rates on property, which are these two lines here, um, when adjusted for inflation, they, they're decreasing over time. So the actual tax rate itself is decreasing. And that decrease in property tax rates is not corresponding with a decrease in the overall amount that people are paying in property tax bills because we have that other piece of the equation. So this is really trying to, trying to show that it's important to consider property tax bills, the overall liability that people are paying in taxes and not just considering tax rates. Is that more helpful? Yes. Um, Representative Anthony and then Representative Sims. Can, can I just try to repeat back my understanding of what I think this is saying? You can tell me whether I'm, I'm on the right track or not. I think what, what I, the, the blue lines show that the nominal um, rates are going down, but that the, um, we're still looking at property tax increases because the total ed spend is going up. Um, is that is that right? Exactly. Um, and I would just clarify that education spending right is a is a technical term um, in Vermont's education finance. So I would just make a slight tweak as spending on education. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No more. I don't see any more questions. Representative Anthony, you're. Yep. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Julia. When you say that the uh, asset value, the, the value of the taxable item homestead or non-homestead is adjusted for inflation, what are you using? You're not using the CLA or are you? So what I'm, um, to adjust the property tax revenues, I'm using the NEEP inflation index. That's what's used throughout Title 16. Um, as the inflation index in ed finance. So I'm really just trying to keep everything consistent. So it's a forecast that's published by our state economists each year. Um, and I've adjusted everything to $2020. As you made a comment that the difference between the change in equalized rates and the revenue derived from those rates reflects the change in the underlying asset. Do I, am I hearing that right? Yes. And do you have a chart which tracks that asset change or is, do I just see it by not seeing it? <laughs> that is, a, <laughs> it's a difference, it's a, it's a residual. Yeah, I, you know, that's something that I, um, that I, sort of went back and forth in terms of trying to put together a chart that would uh, that would be able to reflect that. The challenge is um, 
because our grand list is split into homestead and non-homestead and the way that we value or determine, not value, determine which properties are homestead is based on that homestead declaration form. I worried that it may be slightly misleading to, um, to put together a chart that's showing the grand list broken out by homestead and non-homestead each year, because, you know, say, say in, in COVID, there were a number of folks who had a ski house here and they moved here for the year. So they, so they, um, filed a homestead declaration form so that they could get a property tax credit. In that year, their their homes, their ski homes would be counted as homesteads because they were able to file that homestead declaration. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the property itself changed in any way. It was the use of the property. I I understand I understand the, the problem and I, I have advanced a, a theory. <clears throat> that the movement in the asset prices between the two categories, even if no residences were changed, residencies were changed, the two movements in the asset prices themselves have been different over the recent past since the pandemic. Yeah, that's interesting. I really can't speak to that. Um, no. I would I would defer. I don't know if um, if the tax department or someone at PVR would be able to provide more insight on that. Thank you. Peter, maybe you can follow up with Jake behind you after um, we're done for the day. Because he's sitting right behind you. I'm done, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, back to you, Julia. Okay, great. Um, so that, that was sort of my first pass at trying to look at or show what has happened with property tax revenues and, and revenues in general into the education fund over time. And then sort of getting at uh, a few of the questions. Next, I thought it would be helpful to look at Vermont's spending on education over time. Um, some of these charts may look familiar, but I thought it would be helpful to compile them all in, in one place to, to round out the conversation. So this first chart here, um, I, I believe I've presented it in both of your committees, um, but what this is showing is the history of appropriations out of the education fund over time, so since 2005 fiscal year, as well as the change in students in school. So what we're looking at are dollars that have been adjusted um, to $2020 for inflation, and these two blue lines are reflecting appropriations out of the education fund. So this light blue line is the total uses in the education fund over time. And we can see it corresponding here with, with this left-hand side axis. And this dark blue line is showing the education payment over time. We'll recall that the education payment is the sum of all education spending. So, right, that's the school district budgets minus the offsetting revenues, and then the remainder is ed spending, which is what comprises this education payment. So we can see that there's a slight increase over time when adjusted for inflation. Again, getting to Representative Sims' point, we see that dip here in the... Um, a decrease, slight decrease um, during the COVID years. And then we've got these final dots out here to, ref, uh, to show the current 2025 projections from AOE. Uh, just to, this is uh, Peter, um, just to follow up on Rep Sims comment, uh, I'd say it's not only um, COVID dollars, but during COVID years, um, because school wasn't necessarily happening in person, there was a lot of expenses that didn't occur, sports, trips, all that. So districts were, in fact, spending less. And I just, while you're paused, Julia, just to, like, again, reiterate the fact that education spending and spending on education are not the same thing. And we know in addition to the ESSER dollars, there's also been a reduction in title funding this year. Um, that we have not spent as much time talking about as we probably could or should. So back to you, Julia.
Julia? Okay. Hey, Beth. You want to give some testimony? There are one or two more slides. I encourage people to look at them and we can follow up with Julia um, tomorrow. Cool. Hmm. Quick question out here. Does the title loss and title funding correlate with the loss of students? The drop in student enrollment? Um, probably better for someone from AOE to answer. I don't see anyone from AOE jumping to answer. So I will say we can um, have Nicole in to talk about it a little bit, but it's more about um, like the federal budget renewal cycle mm -hmm. and that um, like sort of default rates. It's not about the number of students. Thank you. But Nicole can explain it uh, like 12 times better than that I, than I just did. Um, do you expect that we will have Julia at some point walk through the other slides? Yeah, I think that'd be I, nice. I think they're, they're really very interesting. important yeah. that we often talk about average fiscal spending, but the wide, I don't know what the, the scatter plot, is that what you call those things? Like, those are scatter plots. I, I don't know where. And, <laughs> and <it's, laughs> but I, I just think it is such an important part of our conversation at this moment that we have average trends lines that are clear, but also there is still such wild diversity across districts and... I also don't want anyone to try to understand what an R value is, which is an important part of those scatter plots without having Julia here. And so mm -hmm. even though some of us were once math teachers, I, um, <laughs> I Julia will be back tomorrow and we can have her go through those. So, so actually, Julia explained to me what it was last week. I Great. <laughs> okay. So we will, <laughs> um, so we will have her, um, in for testimony. We also have an award-winning math practicing. Oh yeah. So, so, oh, so we're good. Good. Yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> Do you want to explain? What I'm not going to explain it all. Okay. <laughs> Changing topics entirely. Great. Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. I just texted her earlier and she comes power. So, yes. Oh, She's dear. Not. Yes. Dear, dear. Um, Julia and I like to joke that she's not good with words and I'm not good with numbers. <laughs> and that is going to be really apparent. Uh, I have no pictures, no graphs, no colors for you all. I just have words. <laughs> So I am, can I share? Yeah, let me explain why you're doing this. Yes. So um, a, there's, I mean, we all heard lots of testimony just now, but um, two things that have regularly come up from the field in terms of um, actions we could take this year for next year's budgeting cycle are um, bringing back budget language and at the excess spending threshold. Um, both of those are um, pieces of statute that have waxed and waned and changed and tinkered over the years, including like, I, you know, I, I have not seen Beth's presentation yet, but I imagine that at some point in like 2015, we reinstated something that we took away in 2009 or something like that. It's just sort of one of those standard Going legislative cycle things. Yep. And so I was hoping, um, I asked Beth to give us the history of both of these. She warned me, she asked me if I really wanted us to do something quite this boring. And I said, yes. <laughs> So, thank you, Beth. Thank you. What a great setup. Thank you. Um, uh, but I, it is very dry. So um, I'm, we're going to look at the school district budget ballot language. And so what I have done is, um, is just kind of historically gone back to where I could trace back kind of the origins um, of our current language. So, and I've, I've chosen kind of highlights of the changes over the years and not every time the legislature made a change. For example, we're not gonna go over when secretary was substituted for commissioner in any of these laws, okay? <laughs> um, so this is current law. So in current law, and these are all hot links, this is on the website, these are all hot links. Every act and every um, statute, you can click on it if you wanna see the bigger picture. Um, of the context uh, that the the act that made that change was in. So this is current law. This, um, the 
ballot language requirement lives in 16 BSA, which is the education title, um, in the powers of school boards section in subdivision 11D. And this is just, just the, the language that you all have suspended. So prior to um, 2022, which was when Act uh, 127 was enacted, and we'll get there, that's the last change that you all made to this law. Um, this was the language that um, school boards were required to put on their ballot. So we're gonna start in 2003. And there's no ballot language here. So annually, uh, school districts are required to distribute a budget, right? Propose a budget. There's no ballot language here, but this is the first time that we're seeing a requirement that anticipated homestead tax rate and percentage of home, uh, household income uh, due to income sensitivity is required to be somewhere in the budget that goes out to voters. And then in 2027, you can see here, 2007. Sorry, 2007. <laughs> um, you can see here we're changing the title. We're still in the powers of school board section. Forum of vote if budget exceeds benchmark and district spending is above average. So this is adding a brand new concept to the budget process uh, called the maximum inflation amount. Um, I'm not going to, in the interest of time and because we don't use this anymore. I'm not gonna walk us through what this concept is, but it was comparing um, spending uh, year over year um, in, uh, to the statewide average and what is considered an excess. Um, and if your budget did exceed the, the maximum inflation amount, you had to propose a divided question. So all of this is to explain the maximum inflation amount, and then we get down to what's the budget question need to be. Shall the voters, so question one, and then question two. Is that Act 68, Beth? Is that this is 2007 uh, Acts and Resolves number 82. Can we talk about excess spending? Is this? We're going to get to excess spending. Um, this concept, the maximum inflation amount, existed at the same time that there was a definition for excess spending. Excess spending has evolved over the years. Um, so, so then in 2009, we are keeping that maximum inflation concept, but we're just changing the language that needs to be on the ballot. It's still a divided question, essentially, right? You've got part A and part B. If part A is approved, then you know you have another question. And we also have a requirement um, of some language that should look similar to you, well, as the last slide we looked at, but just really stating what the proposed budget is. And then in 2015, Act 46, Act 46 made a lot of changes to the ballot language requirement and the excess spending uh, concept. We are getting rid of the maximum inflation amount concept. And we are actually putting in what we have currently. So Act 46 added the language that we currently have on the books for what needs to be in a ballot for school budgets. So that has been the same since 2015. Then in Act 127, we suspended the requirement that school districts need to put that ballot language on their ballot during fiscal years 2025 and 2029. And then last year in Act 1, you also suspended the requirement to use the ballot language um, during the calendar years of 2023 and 2024. Any questions about the school budget ballot language? Very exciting stuff. Okay. 
excess knitting is a little more exciting. So, and I will just warn you, my area of expertise is Title 16. Kirby Keaton's area of expertise is Title 32. Excess spending, the concept you have to borrow from both titles. So I may get a little over my skis here, but I, I think for today's purposes, we'll, we'll be okay. So this is current law. So excess spending is um, the per equalized pupil amount of the district's education spending defined in Title 16, right? We're in the, we're in the tax chapter here, or title here, plus any amount required to be added from a capital mm -hmm. construction reserve in excess of 121% of the statewide average district education spending per equalized pupil increased by inflation. And then this is how you calculate education property tax spending adjustment and the education income tax spending adjustment. This is how you would calculate um, those. I think everyone uses the term penalty. You'll see that that term is not used in statute. So this is perhaps the most exciting part, and it's the smallest print. So this is the definition of education. So 16 BSA 4001 subdivision 6B. This is the definition section for chapter 133, which is the ed fund chapter. Um, the definition of education spending has a chunk above B, right? There's gonna be more if you have a subdivision B here. But I'm just focusing on what does um, for the purposes of calculating excess spending. So for the purposes of calculating excess spending, education spending does not include everything on this page. And I have put in parentheses the year that this um, exception was added. It may be that the concept of excluding one of these categories existed somewhere else, and I just didn't find that piece of legislation. But in my tracing back of these very specific pieces of law, um, this, is, this is the genesis. This is the first time we're seeing that language somewhere. So um, I don't know how, are you interested in going through each of these? Do you want me to just point out? Just like a point out a few highlights as well. Okay. So um, capital uh, approved school capital construction, um, 2009, 2009, and where's the other 2009? Right, this was, that's in, that was in it from the beginning. Um, uh, let's see. Spending attributable to the cost of planning the merger of a small school. That was also 2009. And then there were a couple added in 2011. So spending that is approved school capital construction spending was added in 2011. Language about special education um, spending was added in 2011. Um, and this is spending that is not reimbursed as an extraordinary reimbursement. The language changed. It's, the concept was added in 2011 and then updated in, in 2017 to reflect kind of a change in how we um, calculate special ed funding. Um, a, there's a number of pieces here related to tuition. A budget deficit in a district that pays tuition to a public or approved independent school. Um, if the deficit is solely attributable to tuition paid for one or more students who move into the district after the budget was created, that was added in 2011. For a district that pays tuition for all of its resident students and into which additional students move at the end of the census period, um, the number of students that exceed the district's most recent ADM and for whom the district will pay tuition in the su subsequent year. So um, 2011 was also added in 2011. Tuition paid by a district that does not operate a school and pays um, tuition for all resident students, except in a district in which the electorate has authorized payment of an amount higher than the statutory rate. These are all things that do not count towards education spending for the, for the purpose of um, 
calculating the excess spending threshold. If you are not calculating the excess spending threshold, mm -hmm. then these things do constitute education spending unless there is some other piece of law that has otherwise excluded them. Um, we've got a piece on a retirement here added in 2014, the assessment paid by the employer of teachers to become members of the retirement system on or after July 1, 2025. 2016, we're adding uh, we're adding an exclusion, school district costs associated with dual enrollment and early college programs. And then finally, we've added the last exclusion in 2019. Costs incurred by a school district or SU when sampling drinking water outlets, implementing lead remediation, or retesting drinking water outlets. And those are all requirements under a law. So again, just for the purpose of calculating excess spending threshold, none of these expenses count. And they were all added over various different years. I'm just like thinking about the special ed costs that are not calculated that are probably 20% and can be more of a school budget depending on. So that's this, not, that's this, interesting that, it's just interesting to me that it's not allowed to be counted it's very specific. So it's the spending attributable to the district share of education spending that is not reimbursed as an extraordinary reimbursement expense um, for any student in the fiscal year occurring two years prior. So it's not uh, most of the education, but you know, most of the uh, cost of special education is going to fall outside of this concept. So I'm just orienting us here. 1997 is when we're creating the Ed Fund. And then in 2003, we're adding definitions to Title 32 for excess spending and for the how we calculate what the excess spending penalty is. And then in 2005, we're gonna, the district's education, we're gonna change what excess spending means in Title 32. So the district's education spending plus any amount required to be added from capital construction minus school uh, uh, deposited into a fund to pay for future approved school capital construction costs. Okay, we're in 2005. If you remember that giant list of expenses that we just walked through, we didn't really start adding those until 2011. What you're going to see is concepts added to Title 32 to exclude from education spending and con in um, calculating the excess, excess spending penalty threshold. Um, but then at some point in time, everyone decided to move to Title 16. 2006, we are um, including, uh, so we are again, minus, so we're adding another exclusion here, the portion of tuition paid to an independent school designated, et cetera. That language should look very similar. We just essentially walked through it um, on the other, the giant slide of tiny print. What slide are you on? I am on 14. Thank you. 2007, we're adding another exclusion, a budget deficit in a district that pays tuition to a public school when it's because someone moved into the district after you um, budgeted. And in the same year, in a different act, portion of education spending attributable to the district share of education spending in excess of $50,000, this turns into the um, extraordinary reimbursement uh, for special education exclusion. In 2009, some more changes, we're adding, we're excluding certain costs, we're excluding certain ex costs and expenses. And then in 2011, in Title 32, we're getting rid of all this minus, right? This is what, these are all the exclusions. You'll see Act Number 45, Section 13C, we're repealing all this language in Title 13, or Title 32, and where is it going? It's going in to Title 16. So set the right, the next section 13D, 
is we're starting to add all of those exclusions to Title 16 for the definition of education spending for the purposes of calculating excess spending. So we've pulled it out of Title 13, we've added it to this definition. Um, and then in 2013, we change the excess percentage. So we started with 125% of the statewide average district education spending. And in 2013, Section 1 changes it to 123% for budgets in fiscal year 2015. Does anyone in this room remember why that happened? So you see, you're talking about B? Yeah, it was part of a negotiation. Um, I don't remember exactly what, but the um, there was uh, probably some addition of revenue to the education fund and as a condition, there was a pushback, I think, from the administration to lower that number from 125 to 123. Yeah. Hey. And then in the same act. I think it's done again later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> same act, the next section, literally. Yeah, there it is. For budgets in fiscal year 2017 and beyond, it's lowered from 123 to 121%, which is our current threshold. Um, and then in 2014, we're actually going to increase this number by inflation. That wasn't a part of this process before. So it's the um, excess spending is in excess of, and this, this is just because this is occurring, this act is occurring in 2014, which is before that 121% kicks into place. So in excess of 120 something percent of the statewide average district education spending for equalized people, um, it used to just be in the prior fiscal year. Now we're doing it increased by inflation. And then in 2015, 2016 acts and resolves, um, oh, um, it's amended to year 2015. So um, this is 2014, we're using the 2014 um, as the base. And then in 2016, we're actually using the base year for inflation um, as 2015. And then in 2015, Act 46 added a definition for education income tax spending adjustment. So we had the, ed the education property tax spending adjustment, was how, which is how you calculate that, um, that penalty. Um, and now we're adding the education income tax spending adjustments. And Act 46 also repealed the um, divided vote um, concept or, uh, from the um, school budget uh, language, ballot language, um, which is where that um, maximum inflation amount concept was and was repealed. And uh, not part of this brief, but also in Act 46 were the allowable growth rates to control education spending that got ripped out in 2016. Right, Beck, you will be so happy. Did you include it? I did. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really took a journey and prepared. Oh, there it is, allowable growth. Yeah. Presentation. That was a fun one. Um, so also mm -hmm. in Act 46, further amended in um, Act 65 from 2016, it changed the way excess spending was calculated, but only for fiscal year 2017. And that is the allowable growth in education spending concept. And if you click on this link and you go to those sections, you can walk through that language yourself. <laughs> um, I'm happy to pull it up if you want to see what it looks like. The important one is part of it. It's only lasted nine months before it got ripped out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then... Um, Again, Act 127 made some conforming amendments to the um, excess spending section in Title 32. But most importantly for your conversation is, again, Act 127 suspended the excess spending penalty during fiscal years 2024 through 2029. So that law remains on the books, but it is just in suspension, moratorium, suspended, paused, whatever you prefer. 
President Anthony. Thank you. I just found this fascinating because yeah, I could just sense not being around as long as my colleague from St. Johnsbury, but and not hearing those debates, but you could tell that the legislature was watching the attenua attenuation of the spread of per pupil spending and saying, gee, we maybe ought to do something. And it's sort of tepid, <laughs> you know, teasing some things in and some things out and changing the percentage. But it's an underlying trend that obviously disturbed people. They just didn't grab it and, and fix it back along the way. <clears throat> back to you. That's it. That's it. Okay. okay. You sure you don't have like 10 more slides? For this? <laughs> don't, tempt, don't tempt me. <laughs> Can I just ask a question? Yeah, of course. Um, that the, on the other slide, uh, I think that Julia provided and that uh, Representative Sims pointed out the discrepancy in spending um, across the state. Is that a result? of uh, suspending the excess spending, or could it be? I'm, I'm just wondering, is there a correlation there? So remember, education spending includes everything that is excluded for the purpose of calculating excess spending. And so the excess spending penalty is essentially, you're double taxed, essentially, mm -hmm. for going above a certain number, mm -hmm. and that affects your tax rate. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily affect your education spending in any way. It may lead to different choices, but the excess spending penalty is a tax, it is the result is a tax rate change, mm -hmm. not a change in uh, spending. Spending. It, again, it may influence, I think the purpose of it is to influence spending, right? right? Um, well, that's what I'm wondering. But it doesn't like knock anything off a budget. Right. Representative Anthony. And I would just comment that it also uh, was suspended as we approach the uh, explosion in the adjustment of the CLA besides. Mm -hmm. So uh, it didn't stop what was happening because of the CLA uh, decline, acceleration in asset values for Homestead. Um, I know that we did not do all the conforming changes in 127 that we probably should have just in order to not have the bill be 400 pages long. Um, and I'm curious if when we, I know that we suspended the excess spending threshold because it wouldn't have sort of worked during the immediate transition. And I know that we don't have an equalized, we don't have equalized pupils anymore. Did we make those conforming changes or do those still need to um. happen? Well, let's look. So current Did folks follow my question. Yes. I, I, I certainly okay. great. Okay. I will say, um, as you continue to work in this area, there is always um, the yes, we did make those. You did make those changes. So um, per equalized pupil has been struck, and it's per pupil education spending now. Okay. Thank you. Um, but I will, but not per weighted people. No. So, okay. Interesting. Um, as we continue or as you continue to work on this subject, um, I do think that the, um, the definitions around excess spending could use a second set of eyes to ensure that they are, um, the words used accurately reflect all of the math being done. Thank you. Um, I think with that, it's 11.53, and we um, did a lot this morning. Um, we're, I think we're back in our committees of origin behind, um, after the floor. And um, I know at least Ways and Means is going to hear from Julia Richter finishing her testimony. Um, she's driving to the State House now. Um, I did ask her not to, but she, you know. It's downhill. Gets to make her own decisions. And um, she goes wide. <laughs> and then we're going to have a committee discussion, essentially as if we were each sort of offering testimony to each other about what, like, what big 
um, what solutions what solutions we're recommending to committee members. I have no idea what the House Education Committee is doing. Do you want to? Uh, when do the know? smarter people with only <laughs> the people keep saying. checking our plans? We have some members who are not able to make it in today. So similar, yeah, we're going to aim to have a committee discussion as well after the floor. And I think Representative Sims made this joke, but I will repeat the joke that um, when we had two folks testify that say, I'm sure, you know, I'm not going to offer this. The smarter people will figure out. I think that's who's sitting at this table is what they meant. Um, and that's a lot of responsibility. I just want to sort of name that. Representative Anthony? I, I wanted to enter some testimony. You said, wait till we get into that. We're going to do that this afternoon in oh, committee. Together? Not join, just wait it's, it's going to have a conversation. That's part of what I wanted to say speaks to Brigham, which is really uh, thought to be an education ruling. Yes, so we can talk about that this afternoon. Very well. Representative Austin and then Maslin. Yeah, I interpreted her saying the smarter people were the people in the field. Oh, good. I hope so. I agree. That's as great. <laughs> Very reassuring. Yeah, Thank you, Representative. I don't consider myself. Okay. No, me either. I it's just mainly it's like everyone wants someone else to solve this, and well, eventually we can't they, all pass the buck. Have a bet. You know, the experts in the back absolutely can form our decision. Yeah. Representative Maslin? Yeah, just a comment. Uh, maybe sidebar comment or something like that. Um, <laughs> this has all been very interesting. Some of this stuff we've heard before, some of it has been new or at least nuanced or something. It's um, very, very helpful. Um, the question that I have for all of us who we're not going to resolve right now is what's our process? We can go back to our committees and do the same old, same old, mm -hmm. and we won't get anywhere. And um, there was a, a woman who was sitting over on the side about a week ago who said she was an architect to use the term charrette. People are familiar with mm -hmm. that term. Mm -hmm. um, charrette in architecture school is you get some people and you give them an assignment and they're supposed to come back on Monday with a design for a building. Something like, you know, it's basically a, a forced march to come up with a solution. And we might employ some sort of a charrette where we draw on everything we've heard and come up with an actual proposed solution. And and, and the, the point is it's proposed, you know, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes some really neat stuff comes out of the collaboration of of different people, six people or eight people or whatever you want to have it. And um, sometimes the results are fascinating. Mm -hmm. and so I'm just, it's a suggestion on a, on a different process that we might employ. I, I agree. I think that's a great idea. And I think, um, I know that House Education is thinking about um, what a working group would look like. And I imagine that we should be doing that on ways and means as well. Um, thanks everyone. We um, see you in the afternoon.